The animal kingdom is full of all sorts of things that we are never truly going to understand, and that's okay for the most part. Part of the mystery of life is that we don't understand everything that happens. For example, while we do fully understand that many animals have family and friendships that are almost human in nature, there are some animal friendships that, quite frankly, defy explanation. From a warthog and a mongoose being best buds to a butterfly and an ant, here are 20 weirdest animal relationships. Number 20. Warthogs and Mongooses Now I'll begin with two very different animals who really don't seem like they'd be best buddies, but yet they are, and to one extent or another that is. Warthogs are creatures that are big and bulky, they have tusks, and you don't really want to make them angry. Oh, and they're actually the inspiration for Pumbaa from The Lion King. Mongooses, however, are stealthy animals that are mortal enemies of snakes. So again, how do these two get along? Well, it's because the former needs the latter to get bugs off of its back, quite literally. What happens has been documented many times over the years, believe it or not, mainly in wildlife parks, but theoretically it does happen in the wild as well. The example I'm about to tell you about came from Uganda's Queen Elizabeth National Park. What would happen is that the warthogs would come across a group of mongoose, or is it mongooses? Who knows? And then they would lie down and the mongoose would groom the warthogs so that they could get and eat all of the ticks and other bugs and things that were literally plaguing the warthog. It seems like something you'd find in a Disney movie for sure, but it is in fact real. This would be the basis of a documentary called Banded Brothers, and the hope of making it was to get scientists to see if this happens a lot more often than we may realize. And that's the thing about many of these relationships. It's not just that they're friends, but one can actually provide a service to the other. The warthogs can't get the bugs off its back, but the mongoose can, and thus they have a bond to help one and feed the other. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Larva and Ants The insect world has all kinds of relationships that are well documented, like the hierarchy mindset of places like beehives and ant colonies, but when it comes to butterflies and ants, you don't really hear tales of them working together at all. However, for a certain set of butterfly, they actually enlist a bunch of ants to help them, though it isn't a mutually beneficial thing as it sounds. Because at first, it's a relationship that is very much like the warthog and mongoose. The larva of the lichened butterfly is able to secrete a sap that's very tasty to ants, and so by giving them this nectar, they stay around the larva and protect it from harm. A very symbiotic relationship, right? Well, almost, because the catch here is that the butterfly larva needs the ants to stay alive, and yet the ants could possibly go and get food anywhere else. So why stay around the larva at all? Well, the answer is they have no choice. No, really, I mean it. The nectar that's secreted has certain effects on the brains of the ants to the extent that they have their motor functions lowered so that they actually can't leave. But they still contain their aggressiveness so they can fight when it's needed. Yes, this is a butterfly larva that's literally drugs to ants so that it can be protected until it's a butterfly. It's also apparently emitting a smell that lures the ants so that it definitely gets its bodyguards. And you likely thought that all butterflies were nice, didn't you? Number 18. Turkeys and Deer now at first you may not think that turkeys and deer have all that much in common, but there's one undeniable link that rests between them. They're both creatures that are hunted by humans during certain points of the year. And some idiots actually hunt them illegally, but that's another topic for another day. 
The point here is that while much of the year they do know how to stay well hidden and are relatively undisturbed as a result, when it comes to hunting season, they end up having problems, to the extent that their usual human avoidance methods don't work due to persistence of hunters. So what do these animals do? Well, simply put, they work together to avoid the hunters. There have been multiple accounts of hunters and others who swear that both the deer and the turkey work together in order to avoid a dangerous situation, each of them bringing their own skill set to the table to ensure survival. For example, turkeys have incredible eyesight that ensures that they can see the danger coming. Meanwhile, the deer, typically a male buck, uses its strong nose to catch the whiff of danger and then relays it back to its turkey allies. According to those who've witnessed this very unique union, if the turkeys notice something first and walk away, the deer would follow. Or if the deer smelled danger and tried to get away, the turkeys would follow them. It almost sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, but it honestly boils down to the most basic of instincts, survival. And sometimes you survive best when you're not alone. Number 17. Sunfish and Seabirds Fish and birds tend to have a rather one-sided relationship, especially when it comes to seabirds, mainly in that birds like to eat fish, and the fish that are near the surface of bodies of water tend to make for easy pickings. But what if I told you that when it comes to sunfish, aka the mola mola fish, and albatrosses, they actually help each other out? This would be witnessed by a group of fishermen in the northern seas of Japan, where a large school of mola mola sunfish was observed floating at the surface a number of albatrosses in the water close at hand. Upon closer inspection, the team observed that these fish were carrying parasites called panella, a crustacean. The panella buries its head into the flesh of its victim, leaving a long egg string hanging out. As the scientists watched, the fish would follow the birds, and the albatross would extract the parasite and then eat it. Other birds caught on, and a full-fledged sunfish cleaning would ensue. The sunfish were trying to attract the birds, swimming alongside them and exposing their sides to their winged helpers. Now, if you're getting a deja vu kind of feeling, you're not alone. This is very much like the warthog and the mongoose, in that one has an unwanted visitor, and the other has a need to eat, so one got the other to help out. The only real question is, how did the sunfish learn to do this trick? Nobody really knows, but nobody can deny that it works. Number 16. Iguanas, Crabs, and Sea Lions now this is a trio of creatures that you also wouldn't likely put together in a combination platter of animal relationships, but in the Galapagos Islands, a place where a true diversity of life can be experienced by all who visit, there's a relationship between these three and even small lizards that help all involved in a way that's honestly rather refreshing. and it all has to deal with mutualism. Mutualism is a description of a relationship between two animals found very commonly in the natural world, and it's one where both organisms benefit from each other. Crabs are often seen creeping along the backs of sleeping lions, eating ticks off the mammals while they lay on the white sandy beaches, and furthermore, lava lizards are frequently seen close to colonies of marine iguanas. Pesky flies are attracted to the masses of sunbathing reptiles, but as marine iguanas are herbivores, they rely on the much smaller lava lizards to remove the flies. So here you have two very different sets of animals, in regards to each pairing, working together for the greater good of both. Some previous entries could absolutely be defined as mutualism as well, and this is no doubt something that makes the Galapagos Islands very special, because there are all kinds of relationships on those islands due to the variety of life that exists there. It's no wonder that so many people want to study there and see just how much is going on with these animals. Number 15. Pearlfish and Sea Cucumber this one, I promise, is not fake, even though it sounds like one of the most dumb and out-of-this-world things ever. It's actually real, and there's proof. Now, in the oceans of the world, especially near Australia, there's a fish known as the pearlfish. It's a creature that has a one-track mind in terms of finding safety because it lives inside of other things. 
Yes, this is a parasite of sorts that finds a house and then lives inside so that they can stay safe from predators that are trying to eat them. So far, so good. But one of the preferred places to live is inside of sea cucumbers, which if you think about it is kind of smart, as sea cucumbers are alive but not alive. Except the spot that they choose to enter the sea cucumber is a bit, well, wrong. It's really, really wrong, in fact, because they enter their host through its anus. Now, I swear I'm not making it up. It will actually detect the water that's being expelled from the cucumber and then insert itself into the cucumber's backside from the region the water was expelled from. Oh, and if you thought only pearl fish per cucumber is standard, it's not always. Sometimes they do pair up inside the anus. <laughs> All right, I'm done with that. I can't take it anymore. The animal kingdom can be really, really too weird for its own good. Number 14, Nile Crocodile Plover Bird. Here's a combination that no one would see coming if they didn't know the true ways of nature, because in terms of crocodiles, the Nile crocodile is easily one of the most vicious around, not the least of which is because of the fact that they're known man-eaters and will happily pop up out of the water to get a snack. The idea of it going and connecting with a bird of all things for a good relationship just sounds kind of ludicrous, except when it comes to the plover bird, they honestly have a really beneficial relationship that's simple to describe. because it's a topic that we've covered before in mutualism. In this case, the crocodile will open its mouth and the plover bird will fly right in. What happens after that is the bird actually picks the teeth of the crocodile clean of food and other things that might have gotten trapped in there. The bird gets a very easy meal and the croc has clean teeth that aren't infected or hurting. They've come so accustomed to this relationship that the crocs will leave their mouths open for hours on end until a bird cleans them, and the birds see this as a signal that the croc is in need. Number 13, Sharks and Pilot Fish. Now this one you've no doubt heard of because it's been featured on shows like the Magic School Bus before due to its documentation. I speak of course of sharks and pilot fish. Sharks are by and large one of the most feared creatures on the planet and for good reason. They have really sharp teeth long, powerful bodies, and are more than willing to take a bite out of just about anything if their personalities dictate it. But as great as sharks are, they're not immune to parasites of the ocean trying to take a bite out of them, and that's where the pilot fish comes in, as they'll feed off of this parasite, but they also get good food either way. The pilot fish get sustenance by feeding on the pieces of prey that are left behind or dropped all over the place by the sharks, so they end up getting fed in multiple ways, and the benefits ironically don't end there. You see, because of the fear that sharks inspire in the ocean and on land, very few creatures are openly willing to swim next to them, so thus the pilot fish basically has a bodyguard while also having a constant food source. And again, the shark gets to have itself clean of annoying parasites and doesn't mind having the minor company around since they can earn their keep. Number 12, Coyote and Badger. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about the honey badger because we all know the honey badger don't care. But in terms of regular badgers, they're apparently not afraid of teaming up with other animals. What has surprised many, though, is that the animal they're willing to team up with at times is that of the coyote. You know, one of the most hated land animals around. But it is true, not only have they been seen working together by multiple people, they do so in a way to hunt down food. So how does that work? Well, quick coyotes can chase down a fleeing animal, while badgers can go after prey that burrow underground. It's been shown that by working in tandem, both species are more successful hunters than if they went at it alone. However, there are some catches to this that make the relationship even more weird, not the least of which is that, as noted before, they're both hunters. And what's more, while the relationship has been documented many times, it's not the only way they hunt. 
far from it in fact. And in wintertime, badgers don't really need the coyotes to hunt as they have very easy means of getting food. Thus, the question has to be asked. If they don't need this relationship to get food, why do they do it? And even more, how did it even begin? Because this is a very atypical relationship, and yet somehow it works because nature is truly full of mysteries. But then again, if the coyote tried this with a honey badger, oh, you absolutely know what would have happened. Number 11. Hermit crabs see anemones. This is another very popular symbiotic relationship that's formed in the animal world, because for this one, we go to the world of the ocean where hermit crabs are under constant threat of predators, mainly ones that love to snack on them from above before they can even react to what's going on. However, there is a clever trick that these hermit crabs have to help ensure their safety. They find a sea anemone and then put it on its back. That way, when the predator, such as an octopus, comes around, the anemone will sting them as they try to get the crab. That way, the crab stays safe as it travels along, and the anemone fits perfectly on its back so that it clearly has a match made in ocean heaven. But what do the sea anemone get from all this transaction? Well, aside from a free ocean cruise, they're able to eat the snacks that are left behind by the hermit crabs when they eat. So again, a true symbiotic relationship and one that's also one of mutualism. Sea anemone have other such relationships with creatures, one of which I'll be detailing a little bit later in the list. Either way, this is a great example of creatures noticing the effect that things like anemones have on others and realizing that they can utilize it to their own advantage. Number 10. Tarantula and Frog now, I'm not going to lie to you, anything that has to do with spiders kind of freaks me out. And the idea of anything other than a spider working with a spider, well, I would question that thing's intelligence. However, in Peru, a photographer was able to capture a truly unique partnership that's going on between a Colombian lesserback tarantula and a dotted humming frog. Specifically, the tarantula was seen hovering over the frog, and the frog was positioned right in front of a set of spider eggs. So what exactly is going on? Well, this is very much the case of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. A recurring theme, if you can't tell. In this case, the spider wants protection for its eggs, and the frog is willing to do that via standing guard and then eating any ants or fellow bugs that may try to take the eggs as a snack. In return, the tarantula offers its own protection for the frog, as the frog is often prey to other things, and the spider ensures that predators don't get too close. Yeah, I'll admit I'm not exactly sure how the relationship came to be, but more than likely it's something that happened randomly and both sides just decided to keep partaking in it. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if animals had a kind of communication with one another that ensures that pairing would work before it's done. Either way, it works for both sides, and these pictures just prove it did happen. So believe it or not. Number 9. Drongos and Meerkat Earlier I was talking about Pumbaa, and now I'm here to talk about his best friend forever in Timon. Sadly, meerkats and warthogs are not known to be the most friendly of creatures, but meerkats are apparently fine with getting close to drongos for certain things, even if it's for the worse. Among the rolling red dunes of the Kalahari Desert, the song of the fork-tailed drongo provides a warning that predators are lurking close by. The songbird acts as the desert's watchdog, always poised and ready to warn its fellow creatures of impending danger. Which sounds great, right? Well, there's clearly nothing wrong with that, except that these birds are liars. And they're tricking creatures like meerkats with every single cry they make. <laughs> 
Drongos have a talent known as vocal mimicry. Think of it like parrots, but instead of copying words, they copy vocal alarms from other species like meerkats. They'll spy a group of meerkats eating food, sound the alarm, and then watch as they flee without the food. That's when the drongo will swoop in and eat everything that it sees. Thus, it doesn't really need to hunt in the traditional sense, but rather just pay attention to the creatures that have been hunting and finish the meal for them. Them. These birds are indeed very much jerks. Number 8. African Rhinos, African Oxpeckers this is a familiar tale, but one that focuses on some big and small African creatures this go-round. The African rhino grazes on the savanna and shelters in dense thickets of thorny brush. Ticks lurk in both of those spots, waiting to fling themselves onto a host, and the rhino's skin is thick but also very sensitive and well supplied with blood just under the surface. Ticks and other skin parasites make the rhino itch horribly, so he spends a lot of time and energy scratching himself on rocks and trees just trying to get rid of them. Now obviously it doesn't always work, so it needs a little bit of help. Enter the African oxpecker. Well, kind of at least. This bird cleans the rhino by plucking ticks from its skin, but does so selectively, preferring big fat ticks that are already engorged with blood, ignoring the little ones that irritate the rhino just as badly. The oxpecker also searches for any wounds or sores that the rhino may have and then removes botfly larvae and other parasites, but in the process also removes scabs and tissue, which causes fresh bleeding, and that's obviously bad. So yeah, it is another jerk bird. Why are they all jerks anyways? Why can't they just be nice? and help the rhinos. What's more, they do this to other animals as well. Number 7. Gobies and Pistol Shrimp Fish and shrimp sound like a wonderful seafood meal. In fact, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. But in truth, I'm here to talk about another symbiotic relationship that happens between two very unique sea creatures, the goby fish and the pistol shrimp. In this one, the pistol shrimp is almost completely blind and is incredibly small, and this would make it very easy prey for various predators of the waters, and that's something that the shrimp obviously don't want. Enter the goby fish, which is the shrimp's guard dog, if you will. What happens is the two will stay in contact via the shrimp's antenna, and then the goby fish will alert the shrimp as to where the predators are. Pistol shrimp are burrowers, so the fish is able to live in the burrow that the shrimp leaves behind. And when the burrow needs to be cleaned out, the fish ensures that the shrimp survives so that another home can be made. Number 6. Manta Ray and Remora Manta rays are one of the most majestic things that you're ever going to see in the ocean, not the least of which is because they're often very huge creatures that seem to glide every time they swim. They can reach wingspans of up to 25 feet and weigh as much as 5,000 pounds. So how is it that something that big and agile needs help from a fish like a remora? Remoras are eight species of small marine fish that are sometimes called sucker fish or shark suckers. Over time, they developed flatter, front-facing dorsal fins that act like suction cups, which allows them to attach themselves to manta rays, sharks, and other large marine vertebrates. As you likely have guessed, the remora helps clean the skin of the manta ray, which ensures that it's free from parasites, and in return, gets food from the famous messy eaters, and they get a free ride around the ocean as well. Number 5. Ravens and Wolves now, I would just love to make a Game of Thrones reference here, but I'm still pretty sore about how it all ended. Wolves are legendary hunters, and ravens are very clever birds, so it's really surprising that they've found a way to work together. How this particular relationship works is really basic at its core. It's all about food. Ravens, being messenger birds, will find a pack of wolves and guide them to the site of a carcass. The raven would eat the carcass on its own? Well, not exactly. It needs the wolves to help open up the meal to get the good bits from inside. 
And so the wolves get a free meal, and the raven gets whatever's left behind by the pack. It's kind of simple, it's very effective, and it works in all seasons, especially when winter is coming. Number 4. Sloths and Algae now here's another pairing that you would not expect to see, because let's face it ladies and gentlemen, sloths, well they're quite slow and lazy, you can't really deny it. They are, they've been that way for a while and they're not going to change. Granted when they aren't being lazy, they can be downright terrifying, but since they're lazy most of the time, people don't really notice. Who would team up with such a lazy creature? Well, algae, that's who, or what in this case. But how does it all work? Well, the fur of the sloths are known to be full of spots for algae to live in, and because they have moisture, the algae can feed off of that pretty easily. In return, the algae turn the fur of the sloths green, giving them a kind of camouflage that's very useful to the slow movers in the trees. Number 3. Hornbills and Mongoose Yes, I'm once again talking about mongoose, though this time it's for very different reasons. Dwarf mongooses in the Taru Desert region of Kenya form foraging communities with a variety of endemic bird species, which especially includes the hornbill. The prey spectra of the mongoose and hornbills overlap almost completely, to the extent that both parties will wait to get food if the other isn't present. or if they're asleep or otherwise away. What's more, because both are at risk of certain predators, they'll warn one another should they spot something like a raptor in the area. As a result, they both get food, they both stay safe, and they know that they have a partner they can count on and survive alongside of. Number 2. Leaf Cutter Ants and Fungi this is a bit of science that I didn't really know about at first, and that makes it all the more intriguing because you've no doubt known about leaf cutter ants. They're the ones who cut leaves for various purposes for the colony, and the catch is they're not actually eating the leaves as many would suspect. Rather, they use the leaves to grow fungi. But why? Well, that way they can use it for their colonies and eat the fungi. The ants crush and cut the leaves and even discharge fecal liquids. in order to break down the suitable pieces for their fungus farms. Yes, these ants are true farmers, and they're more than happy to do this on the regular so that they can get food for both of them, and the young ants in the colony as well. Talk about having a perfect system in place. Number 1. Clownfish and Sea Anemones now I told you that I'd be coming back to anemones, because if a crab was able to realize the potential, why not others? In fact, a certain movie should tell you all you need to know about this final relationship. If you recall Finding Nemo, certain fish learn to live in the anemones so that they can stay safe. Because again, predators don't like the anemone sting, and if the fish are inside of it, they can be far away from the predator's grasp while also having a place to live. And that does include clownfish like Marlin and Nemo. Speaking of the fish, the waste that the fish give off during their living time allows the anemone to get the nutrients that it needs to survive. So one feeds the other, and the other protects the other, and it all seems like a great system to me. That's all from the realm of weird animal relationships. Were you surprised that all these different kinds of animals are able to strike up a relationship with each other that wasn't within their species, or even likely to mingle with them? And which of those combinations did you find the most intriguing? Let me know all about it in the comments below. Also be sure to check out the other cool stuff showing up on the screen, and I'll see you next time.